Good afternoon, church. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, uh, alas, uh, I'm not wearing anything green. I, know. I I thought of it at five this morning, and I, I would go, oh, wait a second, it's St. Patrick's Day, and I checked my calendar to make sure, you know, I wasn't off on my days, and that was the last time I thought about it. <laughs> I, literally, from that moment on, I didn't think of anything. I was like, oh, hey, man. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to continue in our uh, study of uh, Isaiah. And uh, for those uh, joining us, uh, we, we have been, this is our fourth uh, study, um, and we started off with uh, chapter one, uh, part one is chapter one, the preaching of a maniac, right? And if you're going to be an inspired man or a prophet, you're going to be considered a fool or a maniac, right, when you preach God's word. Um, uh, the, the second part was chapters two through six. It was about the kingdom of God, you know, calling us to seek the kingdom, fear the Lord, and having a heart, send me, Amen. Um, last week, we, we went through uh, chapters 7 through 12, which is called the Book of Emmanuel, uh, that section, uh, talking about standing firm, Jesus being the cornerstone in our lives, uh, a light dawning, and then, of course, raising a banner for the nations, Jesus on the cross. Amen? So we've got our, our work cut out for us this afternoon. We are going to cover chapters 13 through 24. 12 chapters, that's as much as we did the last three sessions combined. Obviously, we'll skip over a little bit, amen? Um, and the title is Judgment on the Nations. I know. You're like, wait a second, I thought, was, I thought we were going to have a happy day today. Well, don't worry, we'll get to some of the more hopeful, uh, you know, uh, you know, inspiring sections later on. But you got to always have the bad news before you get the good news, right? And I think uh, even still you'll be inspired by our lesson today, amen. Uh, the reason why I've chosen these chapters all together is because they are largely one continuous narrative on judgment on a number of different nations. So I think we can handle it all as one. And we'll just hone in on Babylon here as I believe it's the most applicable to us. And it's the most prominent uh, nation and the, the most uh, largest text uh, from this section. So the, the three points, uh, I'll, I'll reference them in the lesson itself, but it is, number one, judgment on Babylon, chapter 13 through chapter 19, verse 15. Uh, number two is highway from Egypt, chapter 19, verse 16 through chapter 21. And then the final point, point three, judgment on Jerusalem, chapters 22 through 24. Amen? Um, in, the, in the section on where there's specific judgment against the different nations or cities, uh, it is seven chapters long, and almost two of it's devoted specifically to Babylon. And so that's why we'll kind of hone in on Babylon. And, of course, uh, in America, it is probably the most applicable to us. Now, I just sent a map in the church chat. So uh, just take a quick little gander at this. Amen? Now, uh, one thing that you'll notice about this map it, it has all these books on here, and it has the cities or the states where those books were written. So it's kind of cool, you know. So you'll see, you know, like in Israel or in Jerusalem, it has all the different books. You know, some that are in the wilderness, uh, some that are written, you know, in Macedonia or whatever. And so you, you might take issue with some of them. I looked at it, and I go, I don't think that was written in that location. But some don't say specifically, and so there's speculation. But I think you might enjoy just seeing uh, a little bit of uh, the history where the books were written. But the real reason I got this map is because it had the majority of the locations that we're talking about on there. Not all of them, uh, but it was the best that I could find. Amen? So um, there, there's 12 different uh, regions that are prophesied again. So I'll go over them quickly and give you just a little tidbit about each one so you understand what we're talking about. Amen? Okay, so the first one is Babylon. Now, if you look on your map here, Babylon is on the right-hand side, and it's a, a, a little bit less than halfway down. It's like a teal blue dot, right? You see that right there? Okay, and, and Babylon, if you remember, it was prophesied in Daniel chapter 2 that it was the head of gold, right? You, you remember Daniel 2 says that this is you, Nebuchadnezzar. You're the head of gold. Yeah. Uh, it was conquered by the Medes in 539 B.C., um, the second kingdom is uh, Assyria, and Assyria is uh, right here on the map. You'll see it's the big letters. Uh, the capital is Nineveh, and Nineveh is the one where, you know, Jonah went and prophesied against it and everything, right? So um, Assyria was conquered by Babylon in 609 B.C. Uh, the third uh, prophecy against is Philistia, uh, and that's, of course, where the Philistines are from. You guys, uh, it's not really listed on here, I don't think. Uh, but you guys remember the Philistines because that's who David conquered. Remember when he went and fought against Goliath? Yeah. 
and the Philistines kept coming out and taunting them. So that's that nation. Yep. Uh, the fourth is, uh, is Moab. You see it there right above Edom, just, right, uh, just uh, to the east of the Sinai Peninsula. And Moab, you remember, they're the ones who seduced I Israel in Numbers 25. Remember when Phineas had to go get the spear yep. to stop the plague? Right, and so that was Moab. Uh, the fifth one is Damascus. And you see Damascus is there just on the, the, the northern side of Israel, just close to the Mediterranean, not on the coast. And it is the most uh, uh, significant city-state of Syria. It was conquered by Assyria in 532 B.C. Uh, Cush, it's not listed on here, but it's the northern part of Africa, northeast Africa. So today it would include parts of Egypt, uh, Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, uh, Djibouti, uh, Su Sudan, etc. So it's kind of northeast Africa, right? Uh, Egypt, well, that's just Egypt. Um, Edom, uh, that's on the map here, uh, right by Moab, uh, just to the uh, east of the Sinai Peninsula. That's modern-day Jordan. Y you probably would recognize it if you saw it. There's a, a very famous city called Petra. A and Petra, it, you saw it on movies like uh, Indiana Jones and the, uh, Holy, uh, the Last Crusade. Uh, it was on Transformers. And so it's like this, this, ca this uh, canyon, a very thin canyon, and there's a temple and a city that's cut out of the rock. And so that's Edom. Now, interestingly about Edom, it's descendants of Esau. And Obadiah prophesies the total annihilation of Edom. To this day, there is not one single living person who can claim descendancy from Esau. Because when God says it, he means it. Wow. Right? If God pronounces judgment on you, he means it. That's Amen? Right. Let me take warning from that. Uh, that's in modern-day Jordan. Um, okay, so uh, number nine is Arabia. That's, uh, you'll see here, modern-day Saudi Arabia. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about it a different lesson, uh, but I, I believe a lot of the wandering in the desert and even Mount Sinai you can find there, even though a lot of people will say it's not there, but that's for another day we'll get into that. Amen? Um, Jerusalem, that's Jerusalem. You'll see that on there. Um, Tyre is um, just on the uh, Mediterranean there, uh, just uh, below uh, Damascus, and it's to the north of Israel. And then... Um, there's judgment on the earth. That's the 12th region, of course. That's pretty obvious. Amen? Uh, okay, so as we go through um, our text here, uh, you'll see this word prophecy. So uh, go ahead and go to um, Isaiah chapter 13. And, and it says in verse 1, it says, A prophecy against Babylon that Isaiah son of Amos saw. Okay? And so this word prophecy in some translations will be rendered as oracle. And uh, it's the, the Hebrew word is massa, um, and it could also be translated as burden or load. And so when someone brings a prophecy of judgment from the Lord, when someone brings an oracle, it is a burden. And, and is it not a burden to confront someone and tell them that they're not living correctly? Yeah. This is the burden that God has put on, on Isaiah and on us this morning. Um. Now, in our study, you'll, you'll know that we want to gain some knowledge, right? Because Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 says that my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Right? So we don't want to be lacking knowledge and be destroyed because we don't know how to follow God. Yeah. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, it says that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Yeah, yeah. So we can't get so full of knowledge that we take security in that knowledge. Yeah. But we allow our knowledge to more adequately follow God and obey Jesus. Amen? So we don't want to take confidence in what we know, but we want to use that so that we can obey more adequately. Amen. Verse 2. Raise a banner on a bare hilltop. Shout to them. Beckon to them to enter the gates of the nobles. I have commanded those I prepared for battle. I have summoned the, my warriors to carry out my wrath. Those who rejoice in my triumph. Point number one is judgment on Babylon. Uh, now we'll, we'll go through uh, a, a few other sections here uh, against Babylon. Um, but Babylon was the, the premier empire of the day. Um, as mentioned, it is said Nebuchadnezzar is, uh, and the Babylon Empire is the head of gold in the statue, Daniel chapter 2. And you might recall that Daniel refers to him as, you are the king of kings. Not just a king, but a king of kings. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 27 verse 6 says that God would make even the animals subject to him. He, he was ruler over the whole earth and even over the animals. Like, that's a lot of authority. Yeah. 
You likely have heard of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Th this would have been literally the place of all places to be in that day. The most beautiful city, the most powerful city of the day, the most wealthy. And God is pronouncing judgment against it. Look at verse 17. See, I will stir up against them the Medes, who do not care for silver and have no delight in gold. See, he was not talking about a nation coming in and taking over them for their wealth, but just a nation that doesn't even care about them or about life. Just going to come and destroy them because of their disobedience. Their bows will strike down young men. They'll have no mercy on infants. They will, uh, nor will they look with compassion on children. Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the pride and glory of the Babylonians will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and you see here that he used the Medes to destroy them, but it was of God that they would be annihilated. God uses people, but it is, it is his judgment against them. She will never be inhabited or lived in through all generations. There will be no nomads will pitch their tents. There will be no shepherds uh, will test their flocks, uh, rest their flocks, I'm sorry. But desert creatures will lie there. Jackals will fill her houses. There the owls will dwell, and the wild goats will leap about. Hyenas will inhabit her strongholds, jackals her luxurious palaces. Her time is at hand, and her days will not be prolonged. You know, it's, um, you, you get this vision of sort of like a, a, a post-zombie uh, apocalypse city, right? I don't know if you've ever seen any of those movies, you know, maybe like I Am Legend or whatever, right? And, and, and they're in New York City, and it's like lions and deers running around. Totally uninhabited buildings. That's the vision you see. They didn't take it over to live there. They just destroyed it and killed everybody. It was simply judgment from the Lord. But you see that it was a wealthy city. The, the, the jewel of all kingdoms. There was the gold and, and the glory and luxurious palaces that they took so much pride and security in. Go to Revelation chapter 17. We'll, we'll come back here so you can leave your, your finger there. But uh, in, in Scripture, you always have the direct application, the, the fulfillment of prophecy, uh, but you have, uh, you know, likenings, similitudes to it. So uh, you'll see a secondary or tertiary, uh, you know, a fulfillment of a prophecy, right? And, and oftentimes we read something and we sort of liken it to, it's not the exact fulfillment of it, but we understand the principle of it, right? So uh, Revelation largely is uh, written in, in code form. Uh, so as if it was intercepted, people would read it and think, what is he even talking about? Yeah. Right, because it's a, 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 a time of heightened persecution. Yeah. And so in the book of Revelation, you have uh, the city of Rome being spoken of, and it's called Babylon, right? So, so the city of Rome or the, you know, the nation of Rome is being likened to Babylon. And of course, if you know Rome, it was the premier city and, and you know, a, economy and empire of its day, right? Look at verse 1. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit to the wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names. She had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with the abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. Um, and, and it's talking about Rome here. It's talking about the despicable practices of Rome, uh, but also you see the, the, the shimmer, the glitter, the gold, the, the worldly appeal of wealth and of Rome. Of course, this is referred to as adultery by God. Look in chapter 18. It says uh, in the middle of verse 2, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons, a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for un every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. When it describes Rome, it says excessive luxuries. This is likened to Babylon with its excessive luxuries. 
And, and the reason why I wanted to focus in on, on this is because I believe this describes America yeah. with our excessive luxuries. Right. I did a little bit of research. I, I, I was curious. I said, I wonder what uh, the top selling cars were in America in 2023. Yeah. So I Googled this. Uh, the, the number one selling car, no, Tesla's on the list, but it's not number one. Uh, the Ford F Series. A truck. Number two, Chevy Silverado. Another truck. Number three, Dodge Ram. Another truck. Now, now when you're talking about necessity, most Americans do not need a pickup. If you're a farmer, you know there are certain people, but a lot of people they just want to they just want to drive a truck. It's not a compact. It's not economy. They just want a truck. Number four is a Toyota RAV4, and number five, a Tesla. Wow. Now, all of these, except for the RAV4, start around $30,000. Uh, Dodge Ram could be upwards of $90,000. These are the best-selling cars. Yeah, you can get a $90,000 Dodge Ram. Excessive luxury. Wow. It's not it, – it, it, we say that we're concerned about mileage. We're not really. Some people are. Not as a country. You know, Miami is more concerned than most places with excess. More concerned with glimmer and shitter, sh shimmer, and. <laughs> that, that was a close one. Sh shimmer. Shimmer. You know, sometimes you just say something stupid, you know. Amen. Go hold it. Shimmer yep. and shine. Yep. Now, I know, I know, you just, you just gotta, you just gotta laugh for just a second. Just gotta laugh. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Let's move on. Uh, okay, so I know that uh, I know cable's not really a thing anymore, right? But if you look at cable, they have thousands of channels. Not, not just hundreds, thousands. But you want to get to the music, you got to get to like the six thousands and the nine thousands, right? Streaming services, 40,000 plus titles. You know, um, when, I, when we were in New York, um, when we were in New York, uh, there was a, a couple that moved down from Canada, right? And um, a, a lot of times we look at Canadians and we go, eh, they're kind of like Americans. They just, you know, they say funny things like a boots and a. Yeah. A boots. What's this all about? You know. <laughs> and. They pulled up. They pulled up uh, in their apartment. And, 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 and New York, if, if you've never been there, it's probably the most compact city in America. There's other cities around the world that are more compact. But New York, if you're looking at America, it's the one that has, like, the least square footage per person, right? And so they're, so they're small apartments, so you have to be a little bit minimalist to live there. And so they pulled up to their apartment with a U-Haul. And we opened it up. This is a family. And it was half full. And we all looked at it to unload it, and we go, where's your stuff? He goes, this is all my stuff. And we brought it into the apartment. It just took a few minutes. <laughs> and the apartment looked pretty empty. And I go, he's not American. You remember Will talked last time about people have on average 300,000 items in their home? I think that's Americans. I don't think that's globally. And, and it was very – we all noticed it. We go, wow, he, he may look like an American. We may think of it. He's not an American because we value possessions so much. We want everything on demand. If it's not on demand, we don't have time for it. You know, 20 years ago, that didn't exist. I know, I know it's going to be hard for you guys to believe. 20 years ago, on demand didn't exist. It just wasn't a thing. It was, like we couldn't even conceive that this was something that could happen. I remember the first time I saw it, I go, is this really happening? Like, you're telling me that you just clicked it and now it's playing. And he's, yeah. On that PlayStation you're doing this? Yeah. I'm going to do that, <laughs> right? Because before that, the best you had was TiVo, right? Yeah. And so you had to think through. You had to go through and be like, okay, I want to watch this show, this show, this show. And then you had to, you know, tell it to record, but then you could watch it, when, uh, you know, at, at your own pace. 
But 20 years before that, TiVo didn't exist. You had to actually like look and see when was this going to play. And you had to go on the, uh, you know, on the guide and you had to be like, okay, it's six o'clock. And you go, hey, I can't talk on the phone right now. I gotta watch this show. <laughs> if I miss this one, I gotta have to wait for the rerun. Yeah. And who knows how long that's gonna take. Yeah. And everybody knew, like you, co you know, you come to school on you know, the next day, it's Friday, hey, did you see, you know, Seinfeld last night? Did you see that episode? You know, like that's how it was. That was like our generation. Like maybe not your generation if, you know, maybe you didn't experience that, but a lot of people in this room experienced that. Excessive luxury. What, 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 what we view as a necessity, that's 100% of luxury. You know that 80% of the world lives on less than $10 per day. 40% lives on $2 a day. 25% of the world lives without electricity. 40% lives with no indoor plumbing. You know, when we, uh, in 2019, um, Brandon and myself, um, we went to Kathmandu to plant the church there. And Bridget was there with us. She was on the team. Malik was there, but he was not a Christian at the time, so he was hanging around, but uh, <laughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't part of the team, right? Uh, my parents came, and of course, Landon was there too. And there was eight disciples from India who came. And so, you know, we were there for a couple of months. And so we, we planted it, and then we passed on to this couple, Roger and Yessa Green, uh, the great friends of ours, they're Indian disciples. And so we, we were getting an apartment. And so I got one that was furnished because we were going to be there short term. But they all got theirs unfurnished. So I was, you know, over here, and they were on the other side of the road. And so we were looking at the different apartments. And, and Roger, he's been to America, he's traveled around, and we're talking about uh, toilets, okay? So you gotta have a good friend if you're gonna talk about toilets. And he goes, I want a Western toilet. And that's just what we all think of as a toilet. You just, you sit on it, right? And, it, and the alternative is an Indian toilet, which is a hole in the ground. Now it's considered indoor plumbing because water runs to it or, you know, but it's a hole in the ground. Yeah, or you, yeah, you use a bucket. And so he got an apartment with a Western toilet. I did too. Um, it, it didn't have a shower. You had to do the bucket shower. But, you know, after a couple months, you get used to it. It's not a big deal. Um, but this other couple, Anil and Anu, they got an apartment with a Western, uh, with an Indian toilet. And Roger's like, you know what? They could have totally got a Western toilet. And I go, why didn't they? He goes, well, honestly, uh, they're a married couple. He goes, honestly, it's the first toilet they've ever had in their apartment. And I go, wait, run that by me again. They're a married couple. They're from New Delhi. New Delhi is a world, a major world city, 50 million people. It's not like they're off in the, you know, the boonies somewhere. They live in New Delhi. And I go, they've never had an apartment with a toilet? I go, no, this is the first time. They're fired up. And, and I realized, because I've been in their neighborhood before, but it's just the, every family just has a room, and they have a community toilet that they use. Now, now, I'm not talking about like ancient history or far off in Nowhereville. I'm talking about like right now today, our brothers and sisters who live in major world cities live this way. 50% of the world has no access to clean water. And they don't even realize it. They don't even realize it's the water that's making them sick. Nearly a billion are illiterate. When, uh, when we were in New Delhi, uh, there was this uh, wonderful sister uh, named Chandrawati. And uh, she, she went on to glory. She passed away last year, a year ago, at 106 years old. Whoa. Now, she was baptized at 105. Now, you've got to be a fighter to make it in conditions like that to 105 years old. But we weren't really sure her age because she didn't have a birth certificate and she didn't know her birthday. And she wasn't sure what year she was born in. We speculate because her oldest daughter was 70. And she thinks she was about 35 when her oldest daughter was born. So we speculate that she was 105 when she got baptized. But believe it or not, there's a lot of people in the church like that in, in India. They, they don't have a birth certificate. They don't know their birthday. So when they get baptized, we celebrate their birthday on their spiritual birthday because we wrote that down and remember it. But there's a lot of your brothers and sisters who live that way. For us in America, we don't worry about whether or not we're going to get sick from water. We, we worry about why isn't my Wi-Fi working? 
Doesn't, doesn't that get under your skin when your Wi-Fi is not working? Instagram went down for two hours. <laughs> and it ruins our day. Can you believe that bill that I got or that I have to pay? We might be thinking about what we're going to be eating this afternoon, whereas they're worry, worried about, am I going to eat today? Such a different perspective. Now, we can oftentimes view ourselves as poor. I have no resources. Okay, I don't have a lot of income. You know, in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 15, it says that Solomon made gold and silver as plentiful as stones on the ground. And so, in fact, nothing was made out of silver because it was considered little value. The, the country had so much wealth that literally what the rest of the world thought was valuable, nobody even found value there. Now, you may not have a Tesla, but you have a lot of resources. Let me elaborate on that a little bit. You, there is gold and silver on the floor of our country. You have free education. You know that most of the world, you're not entitled to a free education. If you want to go to school, you got to pay. And a lot of people don't because they can't afford it. Now, you, you might not like it. You might not like the neighborhood, or you might say you find problems with it. But you can go to Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and you can talk about how your neighborhood is bad and your schools are bad. They'd be happy to switch you places. You, you have free, clean water. Now, you might say, oh, i got to pay for it. Well, there's a drinking fountain right over here you can get free water from on any corner. You know, our brothers and sisters who live in Kinshasa, DR Congo, and Kinshasa, DR Congo is 20 million people. It's a major world city. They don't have running water in their homes. They, the city turns the water on, and at 2 or 3 in the morning, they go there with a bucket, and they fill it up, and then they take the bucket back home. And if they miss the watering time at 3 in the morning, you have no water for the day. That, that's right now today. We have brothers and sisters in a church of 600-plus people who live that way. You have free health care. Wait, wait a second. I don't have free health care. Yeah, you do. You're walking across the street to Costco. You get hit by a car. And you're unconscious. You will wake up in a hospital. Here. Your ride will be paid for by an ambulance. Someone else will call 911 for you, and doctors will treat you. In another country, you'll be left to die on the side of the road, and the guy who hits you will take your wallet. Now, the hospital's going to bill you later, of course. And you can just not pay it and then write letters to the credit bureaus and then it'll magically disappear. The, like the worst they do is call you and threaten you. Other countries, it's life and death. And here it's just letters and threats and phone calls. Very, very different. In uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 48, it says, to whom much has been given, much will be demanded. And, and I put before you, church, that you've been given much. You've been given much. I have, I have two practicals for you here on this. Uh, you know, Alan uh, mentioned the, the weekly giving. Um, last week, I, I felt that I preached pretty firmly on this point. Uh, to the point of what was comfortable and then past that, maybe 20 or 30%. Do you know that last Sunday, 25% of the church still gave nothing? I, I was I was shocked. I, I literally couldn't believe it. Each week, about twenty percent were about twenty percent under budget. That's what you guys said you would give, not what we told you to give, but what you committed to giving. And about twenty percent is missing each week. That's about ten thousand dollars per month. It, it's a, it's so devastating. I was very disappointed when I saw the report on Monday. What you guys said you would do, many of you guys just didn't do. Psalm 15 says that the one who is not shaken is those who keep their oath, even when it hurts. I, I'm not asking you to give out of your excess, but to have integrity and do what you said you would do. You, you might think that what you do doesn't matter. It does matter. You must understand that we can't continue down that same path. Babylon was destroyed because of their love and their trust in excessive luxuries. And I don't want to see any of you guys fall under that same judgment. I would ask you, give your pledge every week. 
Our, our second practical is missions, right? And our, our special missions, th those who are joining us, we, every year we raise money to support our foreign missionaries. Usually we do it twice a year. Uh, we're coming up uh, on May 19th for the conclusion of our special missions offering. Yeah. Now, I, I realize that I asked a lot of you. I asked all the marrieds and singles, each person, to give $2,250. I, I realize I'm not out of touch with reality. I realize that that's a lot. I asked the campus students to give $1,500, uh, $750. I, I realize that that is calling you to do a lot and maybe something that you don't think you can do. But I believe that you can do a lot. And I believe that you can do more than you think you can do. Now, you might not have extra money. I'm not making that accusation of you. But you do have resources. You have time. You have energy, you have relationships, you have possessions. And I ask you to use your resources to help us support our foreign missionaries. Yeah. You remember uh, last week we watched GNN? Yeah. We saw Jean Bernard on there. W wasn't it heartbreaking to see what's happening in Haiti right now? Yeah. Um, we created the, that section, and, and I cried the first two times I watched it. Not because Jean Bernard was pulling on the heartstrings, but because he was, there was such a lack of self pity that it was convicting to me. He said, it, it doesn't make me lose trust in God. In fact, I trust God more because I realize there's no coincidences. I realize that God could change it, that this is what he wants to happen. And we just want to go and make disciples. So it's literally a war zone. Port au Prince is a war zone. It is horrific conditions right now. And our brother, Jean Bernard, he says, I'm, not only am I willing to stay here, I want to stay here. I want to make disciples. I think the least we can do is make ourselves a little bit uncomfortable so we can support him financially so he can do that full time. You know, I, I was thinking about, like, who's, like, what's the, what's the, the, sit, the person who's in the, the worst situation in our country? Like, you know, you, you say, okay, this person, this person. Like, what's, who's the one who has, like, the least, uh, uh, the most excuses, the least likely to be able to do this? And so I thought, I was going to start off with the teens, and I go, nah, teens, they're, they're te teens got resources. I, I go, I, I got to think, uh, okay, so the teens don't have jobs, right? I go, okay, so who doesn't have jobs? I go, homeless people, they have no jobs. They have no jobs, they have no possessions, and many of them have no relationships because they burned them all. Many people are homeless because of mental health, or drug addiction, uh, addiction issues. So in my mind, when I thought about it, I thought probably a homeless person is like probably like the, the least common denominator. Like if a homeless person could do it, then anybody could do it, right? That was kind of my thought process. So I looked up how much do homeless people make? You can, you can, you can look at this yourself. Um, so this was a few years ago, but during the peak traffic time, they stand on the side of the road and they ask for money. They'll make $50 an hour asking for money on the side of the road. Uh, I, read, I read one thing that said that, that homeless people make $300 per day. What? You guys know how there's a lot of people who fake being homeless so they can ask for money? Because you make better money than going to work. So uh, we have nine weeks until we want to be completed with special missions. Uh, if a homeless person can make $300 a day with no resources, they could raise $2,250, not in nine weeks. They could do it in nine days if they wanted to. And I think all of us have more resources than a homeless person. So the issue is not resources. The issue is motivation. Is this something that I should do? Is this something that I want to do? And, you know, our, our brothers and sisters in Haiti and, and DR Congo, let me tell you what, they don't feel sorry for themselves. They actually probably are happier than you. They're not looking for your pity. I'm not looking for your pity. I don't want you to feel bad. I want you to feel responsible. I want you to realize that you've been given much, and there's a lot of responsibility that's been put on you, and there's a lot from God that will be demanded from you. And I, and I want to call you to do something with it. Let's do our best and give all we can to meet our goal and support our foreign missionaries this spring. Amen? <laughs> Isaiah chapter 14. I promise you we'll go a little quicker. 
Hey guys, now wait a second. We got 12 chapters. Holy smokes. Isaiah 14. Okay, now we pick up. This is a, a small little snippet here regarding Satan. It's, it's kind of out of place. It talks about Babylon, and there's this little piece here about Satan. Verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of dawn. You have been cast down to earth. You who have once laid low the nations, you say in your heart, I will send to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mountains of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zephon. I will ascend to the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high, but you will be brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. You know, um, Satan right here, we understand that uh, he was arrogant, right? So from the beginning, he got, he got tossed down uh, out of heaven because he was arrogant and didn't trust in the Lord. And, and in fact, he was thrown down. You guys may recall in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verse 6, it says that an overseer must not be a recent convert or else he'll become conceited and fall in the same trap as the devil, right? So, so the issue was Satan was conceited. He was arrogant, and he got pulled into this trap of trying to be above God. And, and of course, we can't do that either, right? We've we got to stand in humility before the Lord. Uh, go to, go to uh, chapter 19. Go to, go to chapter 19. It's a, a very, very interesting passage. We'll pick it up in, uh, in verse 19. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt and a monument to the Lord at its border. It'll be a sign and a witness to the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, he will send them a savior and defender. He will rescue them. So the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians in that day, and they'll acknowledge the Lord. They will worship and sacrifice with grain offerings. They'll make vows to the Lord and keep them. The Lord will strike Egypt with a plague. He will strike them and heal them. He will, they will turn to the Lord, and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Uh, point number two is a highway from Egypt. Okay, so I, I did some reading on this because this is a very interesting passage. Like, try to wrap your mind around this. I mean, and for those of you who understand the Bible, there's no reason for a temple to be in Egypt. There's no reason for an altar to be in Egypt. It doesn't make any sense, right? They, they left Egypt. Why would there be a temple and an altar in Egypt? So I was trying to find some sort of historical fulfillment of this passage. Uh, a few interesting things. Uh, there was a temple. It, it's a little bit fuzzy, some of the history here. Uh, but there was a, a, a person named Onias, O-N-I-A-S, and either the third or the fourth. Uh, I think it's probably the fourth. Um, either he built it or he instructed it to be built, um, and it stood from 160 B.C. to 70 A.D. So that's, that's one possibility, and Josephus speaks about that a little bit. Uh, approximately 18 miles from Memphis. Uh, that's uh, Egypt, not Tennessee. Amen. <laughs> Um, now, there, there was an altar built uh, in 1 B.C. by a different Onesius, and this is also uh, spoken of by Josephus. Uh, Josephus is just a Jewish historian. Um, I wouldn't advise reading Josephus. It's like wading through quicksand. Uh, but read a commentary about Josephus and then go back and, you know, fact check it for yourself. But uh, amen. So I, so I was trying to figure out what does this passage mean, you know, and, and just spent a lot of time reading about this, largely which was uh, a waste of time. So, but I was trying to wrestle with, like, what is this whole idea of a temple in Egypt? And any time in the Bible when Egypt is spoken of, he says, I will bring you out of Egypt. I carried you on eagle, eagle's wings out of Egypt, and it means coming out of slavery. Right? The idea is we come out of slavery in Egypt. Right? And so, again, in, in the Bible, sometimes you have things that are very literal, and sometimes they're a little bit more figurative. And so I thought that the idea of this, I, I believe, is less about having a physical temple and altar there, but the coming out of Egypt, out of slavery, into the light, into the promised land. Now, for us, you know that the, the New Testament likens uh, us as disciples coming out of Egypt, which is our sin— Right, And so we, we cross the Red Sea, we're baptized, and then we think, hey, great, we're going to the promised land. No, no, no. You remember they had to wander around for 40 years in the desert. The yeah, the wilderness, that's us on the earth. Yeah. And then they cross the Jordan, and, of course, that's when they go on to glory, they die. Right? And we have some songs about those things. But the idea of having an altar in Egypt is quite interesting because the altar is where sin is atoned for. 
So you're, you're in slavery and your sin is atoned for. And then you come out and there's also a monument that's built there in, in verse uh, uh, 19, a monument to the Lord at its border. And so imagine you leaving a nation and you build a monument. A monument is saying, hey, we were freed, and guess what? We're not going back. And so it's an idea, hey, I've been forgiven, I've been freed, and I left something there to remind me, don't ever go back that way. And, and you know what's really cool? is It's a highway out. It, it's God always clears the path to come on out Amen. and to come to him. Amen. You guys may recall in uh, John chapter 8, verses 31 through 34, he says to the Jews who believed him, what did he say? If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And then you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then they say, hey, we're, we've never been slaves of, everybody, of anybody. We're Abraham's descendants. What are you talking about? And then he says, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Right? The idea of being slaves to sin is what we're trying to be set free from. And, of course, he's talking about this concept of discipleship. He says, good, you, you believe in me, that's a good start. But you got to actually obey me if you want to be a disciple and you want to be set free from your sin. Right. Well, very excitingly, we, we have five who have come to be baptized this morning and be set free from their sin. A anytime someone comes forward and, and is baptized, they understand that, hey, I am being set free from my sin. Amen. I've been made into a disciple, and now I am obeying Jesus. Amen. And, and I am crossing that Red Sea. I am being baptized and, and leaving slavery, having my sins forgiven. Amen. You know, Hosea chapter 5, verse 12, it says, In their misery they seek the Lord. Sometimes we look at misery and we, like, pray that we will get out of it. But anytime when someone comes up and they're baptized, I've never heard this sharing. My life was great, so I got baptized. <laughs> I, I've never heard it. My, my life was great, so I decided to seek the Lord. Everyone, th this is how it goes. My, it was the worst day of my life. So I finally decided to pray. And then right after I prayed, someone walked up to me and invited me to church. Wow. That, that's the story you hear. Amen. Like, we don't want misery. We don't want hardship. But God always allows hardship to come on you so that you will seek him. Yeah. You know, with Babylon, their excessive luxuries didn't allow them to seek the Lord because they trusted in them. But for us, we got to understand that when the Lord puts his hand on, on us, it is to make us change. Just like it says in Hebrews chapter 12. And I want to call a a everyone here to be on the highway out of Egypt. Now, perhaps you have no idea what I'm talking about. Well, grab the person who invited you and say, hey, I want to get out of Egypt. <laughs> I, I don't want to be a slave. I like this freedom you're talking about because, you know what, I am feeling pretty miserable. And maybe you're not feeling so miserable, but you realize there could be something better. Grab a person here and say, hey, help me get on this highway out of slavery to sin. Go to Isaiah chapter 21. Actually, you know what? Let's just carry on. We don't have much time. There's more here, but we just gotta, we just gotta keep moving. Let's go to chapter 22. Our final point, judgment on Jerusalem. Verse one, a prophecy against the Valley of Vision. What troubles you now that you have gone to the roofs, you town so full of commotion? You city of tumult and revelry. Your slain were not killed by the sword, nor did they die in battle. All your leaders have fled together. They have been captured without using the bow. All you who were caught were taken prisoner together, having fled while the enemy was still far away. Therefore, I said, turn away from me. Let me weep bitter bitterly and do not console me over the destruction of my people. Um, Isaiah understood what was happening to his people. And, and he, even though they were not righteous, he, he was like not happy about this. He could not be consoled. It was very, very challenging. Look at verse 11. You build a reservoir between two walls, the water for the old pool, but you did not look to the one who made it. See, the one is capitalized. Or have regard for the one who planned it long ago. The Lord Almighty uh, called you on that day to weep and wail, to tear out your hair and put on sackcloth. But see, there is joy and revelry. Slaughtering of cattle and killing of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. You say, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Uh, there, you, you see the call here for mourning, weeping, and repentance. And instead, what you have is just partying and having a good time. Just 
loving their sin. This is God's people. This is why there was judgment on them. You know, one of the practicals we got to understand is that you got to deal with your sin. You cannot go on deliberately sinning. You can write this passage down in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 31. It says that if someone deliberately goes on sinning, there's, there's no more mercy. There's no more grace left for them. Only fearful judgment and raging fire that will destroy the enemies of God. We got to have a conviction that if, if we disobey God continually and intentionally, we'll fall under the same judgment as Babylon did, as Jerusalem did. Look at chapter 24. Verse 1. See, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. So now it's not just Jerusalem, now it's the earth. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. Verse 5. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. The, the judgment begins with Jerusalem because they're disobeying God's law, and then now it's the entire earth. Look at verse 13. So it will be on the earth and among the nations, as when an olive tree is beaten, or when its gleanings are left after the grape harvest. So he's saying, you know, when you try to pick olives or grapes, you don't get them all, right? You, you, you can't, if you shake the tree, not all of them are going to fall. If you go over the vines, you're going to leave some grapes. And so he's talking about a remnant. There's going to be a little bit left over. So even though most people are going to disobey God, there's going to be a remnant that survives. Verse 14. They raise their voices, they shout for joy. From the west they acclaim the Lord's majesty. Therefore in the east they give glory to the Lord. Exalt the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, in the islands of the sea. From the ends of the earth we hear singing, glory to the righteous one. The, the, the remnant are, are the gleanings, those who are the survivors. And you know what? They are going to shout for joy. And when you realize that you're in God's kingdom, you just got to shout for joy, right? <laughs> yeah, you just got to be fired up and be like, you'd be a little bit afraid and say, I don't want to end up like them, but I'm going to be fired up that, that I made it. I'm going to shout for joy. Go to the, uh, the last verse, verse 23. It says, the moon will be dismayed and the sun ashamed for the Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders with great glory. You get this vision of God reigning on Mount Zion in heaven with the elders seated around him in great glory. And, and that is what is awaiting for us, getting to sit at the feet of the Lord around the throne. Now, if you, if you uh, uh, know your Bible, this likely reminds you of another passage. I'd like to close out with it, Revelation chapter 4. And in Revelation chapter 4, you have a vision of the throne room of God. Uh, you'll know that there are the living creatures that are, are worshiping God. And they sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You see it there in verse 8. And uh, the, the living creatures, this is where we uh, got the song that we sang before communion, holy, holy, holy. And, and you'll see that in this passage, the, the 24 elders are there and they're wearing crowns of gold. And the, the crown is symbolic of salvation, the gold of martyrdom. And the 24 elders are the people of God. So you have the 12 sons of Jacob, Israel, and then you have the 12 apostles, that's the, the Christians, the new covenant. So you have both old and new covenant together. So the 24 elders sitting around the throne of God is all of God's people of all time. And you have the four living creatures worshiping, and then you have the elders worshiping, and they literally take their crown and lay them down before the throne because they realize their salvation was only the gift of the Lord. Unlike Satan, who wanted to be above God, God's people humble themselves before God. You know, uh, there's, there's one uh, final song. I'd like to read the words to close. I, uh, I put it in the chat. Uh, it's the old rugged cross. Uh, this one also has a, a, a mention of the crown, laying down your crown, picking up your crown, your salvation. Uh, I'll, I'll read um, verse 1. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Verse 2. 
on the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. Talking about Jesus. Verse 3. In that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. They realize that it was the cross that gave them their crown. Verse 4, to the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. It's shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it one day for a crown. Thank you, and God bless.